Thanks, Roy. Hi, folks. Good to be here. Um, so my name is Matthew Skelton. I am head of consulting at Conflux, which is a Leeds-based software delivery consultancy. And I'm also the co-author of a book that's been published in September this year called Team Topologies, which is all about, um, well, we'll see. Uh, first off, who, who knows the paint, American painter Edward Hopper? Do you recognize this picture? Looks a little bit like some of his paintings. This is actually a, a cafe in Leeds, just around, uh, just around the corner off Brigham. Uh, I thought it was quite nice. It just happens to look just like uh, one of his paintings. That's it, that's just a Leeds-based reference. <laughs> so there's four things we'll look at this evening. The Spotify model, what that means. Some limitations of, of that model. Uh, a very, very quick overview of some of the um, some aspects of, of what we've been writing about in the Team Topologies book, and then a few ideas on getting started with some of these techniques. We're not talking about this Spotify model, nice as he is. We're not talking about this one either, nice as she might be. Um, so we're talking about something else, which is the, the Spotify model for team design for, for software delivery. And that looks like this. So this was a diagram that's, that, who's seen this diagram before? Just put your hand up if you've seen it before. Uh, maybe only about half of people in the room. Okay, that's great. So uh, it's published in 2012 by uh, two consultants who work at a, a Swedish consultancy called CRISP. And at the time they were working, I think still are probably, working at Spotify to help helping them with uh, lots of stuff about software delivery. And um, it, they, they described kind of four concepts, four ways of thinking about organizing people to uh, do software delivery. The first one is a squad which is uh, an, an aligned, autonomous, uh, accountable team uh, that uh, delivers some aspect of the product. Um, a collection of squads together is like a family of squads. We call that, a or they call that a tribe. So they're working on a similar part of the system. So that in the Spotify case, it might be, I don't know, it might be working on, on music ingest. So you've got, let's say, four different squads working on ingestion of music. And then over here in the, in the other tri tribe, we might have four squads working on music playback, which is a, a kind of similar, uh, similar area of, 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 of the kind of Spotify business. Um, they also talk about, oops, 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 oops. They also talk about um, chapters, which effectively are kind of line management groupings. So people with similar skills uh, are kind of looked after together and, and share experience together, but it's also a line management kind of grouping. And then they have what they call a guild. A guild is a group of people with a shared interest, probably in technology, but it could also be practices. So if someone's interested in, um, I don't know, Little's Law, like we heard before, and they're interested in using WIP to, to improve throughput, then there might be a guild that, that's a, a, around kind of lean practices and that kind of thing. Or it might be a guild of people interested in Ruby or interested in test automation or something else. So they talked about that, 2012, uh, and, um, and, it's, and it's, it's, been, it's been very useful. It's been uh, quite widely spoken about. And, and in many organizations, I've tried to adopt this. What I want to share with you today is some aspects of why this is useful, but also what this doesn't address and what we also need to think about. So that's just a, a listing of, of the, the four different kind of groups that we've just talked about. Squads, tribes, chapters, and guilds. And it's been really, really helpful. So let's have a look at a few of these things that the Spotify model helps to achieve. The first thing is it tends to encourage the flow of change. These squads are, as we heard before, aligned, autonomous, accountable. They're aligned to a flow of change. They're aligned to the kind of change pressure coming from the business or from the, from the, the people who decide what needs to get built. And so because they are somewhat autonomous, then that, they can take an idea from inception through into production uh, without having to wait on anyone else. So it encourages the business as a whole to think about a flow of change and to, 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 to change the way it kind of comes up with ideas and prioritizes, prioritizes them because it can actually, if it gets, if it gets those ideas um, mapped effectively onto these uh, squads, then those ideas will flow through very quickly. We've also 
uh, the Spotify model is, has also helped to kind of establish and clarify team boundaries. One of the things we heard in, in the earlier talk from Andy was about the importance of getting those boundaries in the right place. And um, that's certainly one thing which can come out of, of adopting the Spotify model, greater clarity about team responsibilities. The third thing that the Spotify model um, helps with is to promote a good kind of collaboration. So not all collaboration is good, not all communication between different teams is good, but it does tend to promote the right kind of collaboration. So we've separated off, if you remember, on the left-hand side we had, uh, on the diagram, four squads in a tribe. On the right-hand side, another four squads in a separate tribe. The four, the four squads within a tribe will tend to communicate quite a lot, and that's fine because that's part of the same domain area. There should be less need for those four to communicate with the, with the, the squads on the right-hand side because that's a completely different business domain area. There shouldn't be any need, should be less need for them to communicate. And the final thing, from my point of view, that I think the Spotify model does is to uh, plan and budget for cross-team enablers. So cross-team enablers like uh, communities of practice, like guilds, things like this. We're explicitly expecting a kind of grouping like that. Let's budget for it. Let's put the time in the calendar for it. Let's make sure that people's time is available to be spent on that stuff. Because if we don't explicitly uh, make that time and money available, it may not happen, or it may only happen in an ad hoc fashion. Um, and if key people leave, then it, it'll, it'll stop. So these are, all, these are all really good things. These four things are really great. And we've definitely, quite a few companies have definitely had some success in, in, uh, in achieving some things relating to these uh, outcomes by adopting the Spotify model. Uh, however, there are some limitations. And the first, the first warning, really, is in the original 2012 blog post by the authors who actually wrote about the Spotify model, and they said this. They said, this article is only a snapshot of our current way of working, a journey in progress, not a journey completed. By the time you read this, things have already changed. So the authors of the original Spotify paper on the Spotify model say, basically saying, effectively, don't adopt our model. Because it's not how we run. It's not how we run now. By 2012, it wasn't how they were running. 2016, one of the lead engineers at Spotify, uh, called Martin Florian, presented at uh, QCon, one of the big software development conferences. I think it was in London, but it might have been in New York. And he said, there is no Spotify model. Spotify themselves say, there is no Spotify model. Is Spotify are saying that, Perhaps it's a good idea not to adopt the Spotify model. Perhaps there's something else there, right? These are kind of fairly, uh, these are big mallets, if you like, the, 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 the really obvious things that su should suggest to us. But we shouldn't just look at that nice picture of squads and tribes and guilds and say, oh, that's all we need to do. There's a whole lot more that Spotify are doing that they haven't talked about. And that's crucial to their success. So let's look at four things which I think are missing from simply adopting the Spotify model as people talk about it. The first thing that I think is missing, uh, that isn't really spoken about, is the size of software. How big a piece of software is. And how, and the effect on the cognitive load of individuals, but the, particularly the effect on the cognitive load that a team has to take on. There's very little that, that's, that's spoken about in there. We'll come back to all these four things later. But that's the first thing. The second thing it doesn't really talk about is Conway's law. So we heard in Andy's talk earlier on uh, how um, a long time ago, uh, 67, uh, Mel Conway observed, looking at, looking at uh, engineered systems at the time, which were by and large uh, physical uh, engineered, engineered systems uh, and, and some early data processing stuff with IBM, I think it was, that effectively there's a mirroring going on between the communication paths within the organization and the likely or the natural uh, system that is going to emerge from those communication paths. And actually, um, I don't have it in the slides today, but there's been some research just in the last sort of seven or eight years, quite a few research papers have tried to assess this a bit more, uh, with a bit more um, modern methodologies. And uh, if anyone's interested, I can point you towards some, some academic papers that 
fairly convincingly demonstrate that there is a strong effect at play here. Uh, there's been research done in software, there's been research done in aerospace, car manufacturing, um, uh, aircraft manufacturing, all sorts of stuff like this, looking at component boundaries, looking at um, how teams spread, all sorts of stuff. So it seems like Conway's law is a thing. It's not exactly easy to pin it down, but there's certainly a force at play. And the Spotify model paper doesn't really talk very much about that, which is a problem. It doesn't really also talk about uh, any kind of patterns for ways in which teams should communicate, different ways in which teams should communicate. We'll look at that a little bit later on. And it doesn't really talk about the kind of things we should look for to tell us to evolve our organization, which is incredibly important given how, given how fast some of the markets, uh, whether, it, whether it's a marketplace thing or whether it's um, political situations with things like Brexit or whether it's regulatory things like GDPR, given how fast things like this change, given how, how frequently these things kind of hit an organization, if we don't understand the things to look for, we're going to fall further and further behind. There's probably some other things we need to address too, but I think these four things are incredibly important things that we need to address. When we're thinking about the shape of our uh, organizations, how our, how our organizations work when we're bu building and delivering software systems. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, this book, Team Topologies, that we're still writing. Well, we're in the editing phase, what's called the copy edit phase right now. So this, has been, uh, this is based on research that we've been doing um, for just over five years across lots of different industry sectors. So I go into organizations and uh, work with lots of different kind of people in organizations from the CEO, CTO, down to, um, down to um, developers and engineers uh, working on you know, uh, logging or developing uh, software applications, whatever, um, to try and improve the effectiveness of software delivery. Um, so we've worked with companies based in China, EU, India, UK, US, a whole lot, lot of places around the world. Um, We've done quite a bit of research into uh, peer-reviewed uh, academic articles um, with good statistical significance. We've also got just, a, I think it's 12, 13 case studies, including actually from Skybet. So we actually have a, a case study in our book, uh, not written by Andy, but written by... Uh, yeah, head of, head of, head of platform? Anyway... Yeah, a, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a colleague of Andy. So actually Skybet is, is, we feel, a real exemplary, has taken a real exemplary approach to how they think about their organization, the relationship to software architecture, as you'll have heard from, from Andy's talk earlier on. This work came out of um, stuff that I did way back in 2013. I did a talk on this at Agile in Leeds in this building about, in fact, in this room, so a different meetup group, but in this room, uh, maybe three years ago. Um, so these patterns here, anti-patterns and patterns have become fairly standard for people thinking about different kind of team relationships within uh, modern software delivery. The, the patterns actually came out of a, a blog post that I wrote in a rage when I was working at a company in London and uh, software engineering and operations refused to work together. And so I went home and wrote a kind of blog post in a rage. And uh, anyway, it turned into this stuff. And uh, these, these patterns have been used by quite a few different organizations, including Netflix. So Netflix have found these patterns exceptionally useful. So this is the head of uh, Director of Engineering, um, Philip Fisher Ogden, who says, thanks for insightful articulations of DevOps topologies, blah, blah, blah. They inspired lots of discussions to help us to think about teams. Um, and they've also been really useful at Condé Nast, so Director of Engineering, Crystal Hershorn at Condé Nast also has found these, uh, the characterization of these team patterns extremely useful. And there's lots of other organizations who have found this uh, similarly useful. Um, but we've actually gone kind of beyond static groupings of teams because we think they don't really capture a lot of the detail that is really needed in modern uh, software delivering organizations. The book will be published in, it's actually the 6th of September, 2019. There is, you can pre-order it 
if you go online, so head to teamtopologies.com, you can do the Amazon pre-ordering thing. I think the ebook's there now as well. Um, we're still arguing, sorry, we're still discussing what the cover should look like, so that's why that's not on there at the moment. Uh, so Charles Betts, who's an analyst at Forrester Research, um, has been one of our peer reviewers and described it as innovative tools and concepts for structuring the next generating digital operating model, which is a bit of a mouthful. I don't quite understand it yet, but it sounds great. <laughs> I want to talk through, um, I want to talk through, talk through four aspects of what we've got in the book. There's actually a whole, a whole load of other stuff that we're talking about, but these four aspects, I think, are the ones that speak best to um, those gaps in the Spotify model that I mentioned before. And the first, the, the, so the first gap that we saw before is this software sizing and cognitive load. Um, and I think what's incredibly important is to start with the team as the means of delivery, not individuals. So rather than seeing having lots of individual engineers or software people or testers or, or product owners, we start with a team as the means of getting things done. So here's, here's a simple test to work out whether you have a team first approach in your organization. If you have a training budget from HR or the people department, do they assign it to the team or do they assign that training budget to individuals? If they assign it to individuals, what happens if you've got someone in your, in your team who's amazing at going to conferences, coming back, collecting all the slides, doing a nice little summary to the team, and the team thinks that that person is just amazing at doing that, and actually they prefer to sit in the office kind of building stuff while that person goes out to conferences. So the team wants that person to go to 10 conferences a year on their behalf. Most organizations still these days will refuse to give budget for that one person who's great at doing it to go out and go to all those conferences because they say, oh, you've been to two conferences already. That's it for you, that, that's, that's it. You can't go to more this year. And the team's like, no, we want this person. No, no, that's it. It also means if we're starting with the team, then we actually, there, there's, a, there's a limit on the size of a team um, in the software context of about eight, nine people. Uh, there's some sort of socio-biological stuff behind that. So um, if you're interested, have a look at uh, Dunbar's numbers. There's various numbers that seem to crop up. One around five, one around 15, one around 50 people, one around 150 people. Um, there's some debate as to why in the software context it seems like actually around nine. It seems to be about the limit because it doesn't quite fit with what we see elsewhere, but it kind of is irrelevant. If we've got a limit of nine people in a software team, there is then by definition a limit as to the shared understanding that that team can have about the software they're building. So in other words, we get to a point where the, where the software they are building is too awkward for them to understand properly, so they can't actually support it properly. They can't own it because they can't understand it fully to be able to support it in production. So by extension, when we're thinking about software architecture design in this kind of context, we actually need to think about boundaries, software boundaries, that mean a team can own that thing. And that means there's a limit, there should be a hard limit on the kind of complexity. There's a maximum amount of cognitive load effectively that we can place on the team. And that's obviously a very different place. Uh, that's a very different set of presumptions for software architecture than, than lots of software architecture uh, th than it's been done in the past. We should think about the physical and digital workspace. So if we're all in the same building, how is the, uh, how is the room laid out? If we're actually in different places, what, the, what do the Slack channels look like? What are the conventions for kind of contacting people in different, through different mediums um, and so on? So it's a very different kind of way, all sorts of different um, things result from starting with the team. How our software is built, how our office is laid out, what kind of communications we're expecting to have in place. One of the advantages of, of starting with a team first approach is that actually the number, of, uh, the number of different communication paths within the organization is reduced by an order of magnitude at least. If you remember the slides from Andy before where we had many, many, many different communica communication paths because actually we've, we're now thinking about the team as a unit, 
we've, we've reduced by an order of magnitude the number of different communications that need to happen. There's some here, so Conway's law can give us some heuristics. So given the, the, the communication patterns between different groups in the organization, what kind of software architecture are we expecting to be naturally produced in this organization? And that's incredibly powerful because then we can get a sense of, well, how close to this natural state is our current architecture? If it's fairly close, great, is that, if that's what we want. If actually the natural state is very far from what we've got, are we, are we spending a huge amount of extra time doing that? It gives us some insights into where uh, effectiveness might be being lost or where we're spending lots of extra money. So we can use this reverse Conway maneuver, as Andy mentioned before, um, to try and mitigate some of the worst effects. So if we know we need effectively four separate blocks of system and we've currently got two different teams, perhaps if we split those into four teams in total, that might better map to the four blocks of system. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but you get the idea. The most important thing about Conway's law, really for me, and this is in the original 1967 uh, article by Mel Conway, is that it's a constraint on the solution search space. This is a C-level, as in uh, CEO-level uh, thing. This means that if, if we've got our organization arranged in teams or other kind of groupings in a, way, in a particular way, it might be limiting what we can do as an organization fundamentally. We might actually not have the cap capability or capacity capability to achieve certain things fundamentally. And I need to know about that as a CEO because, because I've got to report to the investors. If fundamentally there's something about how our teams are arranged is limiting our ability to innovate, that's a real problem. So we've, we've defined three different kind of team interactions that we think are the only three that are needed. So this is based, this is based on what we've seen, this is based on the research we've done, uh, and some kind of shaping around that, some, some thinking around that. Three different interaction modes that are well defined. And the first one is collaboration. This is where two teams are working together to solve a problem. However, um, it's time limited. It's two teams with radically different skills or, or quite substantially different skills looking to discover solutions in a space which is new. If we get to the point where we realize we need to continue collaborating for a long time, something is wrong. Because collaboration is costly. It comes at a cost. It allows us to discover stuff very quickly. So for example, if we're looking to move from, uh, from uh, virtual machines to Kubernetes or something like this, or moving from on-premise hosting to cloud hosting or whatever, we're looking to discover something new about IoT, whatever. Bring these two groups together with very different skills, discover something very quickly, that's great, but expect that collaboration to finish. We will see in a minute, we use that collaboration to discover some new stuff which then gets translated uh, into, um, into a different capability in the organization. X as a service, sorry, yeah. Would you expect that a new team to would I expect a new team to develop out the collaboration? Um, uh, possibly, possibly, probably not, but it, possibly, yes. So, so one of the things that might come out of that collaboration is, oh, we actually need to, and we need a new team in, in this area somewhere over here. Yes, could be, could be, could be. Yeah. Um, oops. So X as a service, we've got one team providing something, one team consuming something. Fairly straightforward, right? But there's lots of situations that I've seen in many different organizations where we've not thought about that nature of that relationship. If we're actually providing consuming, what's the experience of providing, of, of, sorry, what's the experience of consuming that service from the point of developers or testers or people trying to spin up a new version of that thing? Is the documentation easy to use? Is it easy to kind of get on board with it and to, to get started? What about the 
um, versioning. So from the point of view of the, of the provider, are we versioning things properly? Are we making sure things are backwards compatible? What, what's, the, what's the experience we're giving? Is it nice to use that service? Um, and then the other kind of team interaction is this facilitating interaction where we've got one team helping another team to achieve something useful. So it might be a team of, say, big data specialists who are working for two months with a software delivery team, helping them to get to grips with uh, whatever, something, some, some piece of big data technology. But they're, they're, they're helping them to upskill, then that facilitating interaction will, will disappear as the facilitating team moves on to, to another part of the organization. So these three, different, th these three different interaction modes are very different. They require different kind of behaviors from people within the team, but it means that the, that the, the way in which different teams interact is extremely well defined. So someone inside the team can now understand why we're spending so much time working with those crazy ops people over there. It's because we're doing this collaboration thing in order to discover something, but only for, the, only for this defined period of time. The output is we've finished discovering this new way of working, and then we're actually going to no longer collaborate. We'll consume that thing as a service. Or why those really, you know, kind of uh, those those weirdos from the data science department having to sit sitting with us all the time. Ah, they're helping us to get to grips with big data. That makes sense. I know, I know what I should expect from them. They're bringing their expertise, but they are not programmers. So I'm going to show them how to write a bash script. But we're being very, very precise and clear about the kind of interaction we're expecting from people, the kind of behaviors that we're expecting between different things. How do you uh, set those expectations? So in, so in in the book, we've got a load of uh, kind of char we've characterized what, how these interactions work and the kind of behaviors it expects and the kind of enable us to, to help this, the, these, the three different patterns work well. The kind of skills you need in the team to make that stuff happen, that, that kind of thing. So yes, it, you ne it needs to be kind of characterized. Um, but we've certainly found that a lot of the confusion that happens inside, inside organizations is down to people not knowing why they're interacting in, another, in a particular way with another team. They don't know why they're collaborating, or they don't know why they're not collaborating, or they don't know why the, the, the thing they're trying to consume is so rubbish, or all sorts of stuff. Um, in the book, so in the book, we, we talk about four different kind of fundamental topologies different kind of teams, different, different, different types of teams. And these, as far as we're concerned, are the only kind of team types that we really need for modern software development. Again, we're trying to make things much more uh, well-defined. Um, I'm not gonna talk about these hugely today, but a streamlined team roughly maps onto a Spotify squad, or I think what Andy, you call a squad as well, don't you, in, in your world? Um, we use the word stream just because it, the word product or squad doesn't map terribly well to lots of different parts of the industry, so we wanted something that was a bit more independent. With enabling team is a team that uses that facilitating mode to help other teams do something. We've got this special uh, team type called complicated subsystem where we, if, there's a part, if there's a part of the system that really needs super specialist skills, like let's say you've got a PhD in mathematics, or, or something, let's, let's just say you have. And, and there's a part of the system which really needs that because it's doing some uh, trading analysis calculation, something, 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 and you, we need that, need that programmers with a kind of mass PhD, that's fine, they would, they would sit inside here. But we only have that, that complicated subsystem if we need it. We generally try and avoid it. And a platform team here, a platform acts as a force, a force multiplier for the stream aligned teams. Pretty much all of the, the majority of teams, the majority of people will sit in a stream aligned team. The platform then is something that they can, they, they can uh, use to enable them to go very rapidly. Um, but the interesting thing I want to show you today, so we've got a flow of change going left to right. We've got different kinds of interactions between different kinds of teams at the same time. So, We've got, we've got the big data team here with, um, that's helping these two streamlined teams to get to grips with um, Hadoop, whatever. Oh, it's probably not Hadoop anymore, is it, anyway? But whatever's beyond Hadoop. Um, 
and, and there's a facilitating act activity going on there. The streamline teams know that they're not experts in big data, so they're going to listen to the facilitating team. Facilitating, facilitating team is, is expecting to teach them some stuff, and those streamline teams are expecting to be taught or expecting to learn some stuff for a period of time. They're expecting not to go quite as quickly because they're in that, in that learning process. However, over here, we've got this kind of X as a service, this, this long dotted line relationship. This component here, as it happens, with these two bottom streamline teams, um, that's just a component. Uh, because it's X as a service, I, as, a, as someone who works in the streamline team, I should just be able to use it. That I, should, I should not need to really collaborate or communicate very much with the people inside the component team at all. I should just look at a wiki page, find out where it sits in the, in the Docker registry or the artifact repository or whatever, pull it down, use it. That's it. I shouldn't need to spend very much time collaborating. However, down here, this streamlined team at the bottom is collaborating with the platform team. They're expecting to spend a lot of time talking together and working together, sitting together, working on some new stuff, some new infrastructure or monitoring or whatever it is for the next two months until they achieve something. So we've got different behaviors that people are expecting within teams at the same time in the same organization because this team, these teams are trying to achieve different things. And what, we, what we've seen is that this kind of clarity is absent from the majority of organizations that are building software systems these days. Sorry, do you mean they like that kind of clarity in their understanding of what's happening in their workplace, or do you mean they like that kind of clarity in the actual model they're working with? Um, they, lots of, most organizations lack the clarity in both what they're really trying to achieve and work on, and therefore also what kind of interaction different teams should, should be having with each other. So we're advocating for a, a, a huge increase in the clarity of the kind of behavior that different teams should engage in with each other in order to be much, more, much clearer about the outcomes that we're, that we're expecting to achieve. Do you see any correlation between the kind of personality types of people working with different teams? Is there any correlation with personality types? Um, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I don't, have, I don't have any useful data about that yet, is the fairest thing to say. I've got some opinion and some anecdotes, but I don't have any useful data. Um, you, you, you might expect slightly more introverted types to be inside a kind of complicated subsystem team, but not, not necessarily. There's a good, we're going to chat later. <laughs> okay, I need to finish. Um, I want to talk very, very briefly about um, using these interactions as a way to help us sense whether things are working well or not. And this then becomes a very, very powerful mechanism for helping us to evolve our organization and therefore ev also evolve what software we build. So it, it d brings in uh, a powerful organizational capability. So we've already seen not all uh, teams in the organization look the same. There is a differentiation based on what the teams are, what the purpose of the team is. We've got this concept of let's collaborate between two different teams, discover what we need to build, but crucially then push it down into a platform. Once we've discovered, ah, this is a thing that actually other teams will need to use, discover a good way of doing it, push it down into the platform, platformize it if you like, so that other teams can consume that thing. So we're not always continually collaborating all the time in order to get our new Hadoop cluster to work. If we find we're having to do that, something's wrong. We either don't have the right skills, we're using the wrong technology, or whatever. But if we get to the point where we go, oh yeah, yeah, we can now operationalize that, push it into the platform, and allow that to be provided as a service, then, then we've, we've got a useful outcome. If we've got teams interacting using these three interaction modes, if there's, if there's awkwardness in these interactions, if something's not quite working, that's a useful signal. Because we've only got these three different ways that in which teams can interact, it's easy to detect when something's going wrong. And we can use that as a signal to tell us, have we got the right skills in the team? Are we missing a capability? Are we building the wrong thing? Are we doing it at the wrong time? Are we going too quickly, too slowly? 
all sorts of things. We're able to detect because we've been much more specific about the kind of behaviors and interactions that we, that we would expect with these different modes. And this allows us to evolve the organization much more, uh, in a much more straightforward way, to, to, to plan an evolution, to respond to external events, internal um, um, market, GDPR, Brexit, whatever, to evolve that organization and therefore also the product that we're, that we're building because we're listening to these signals, signals from within the organization itself. I want to suggest that there's, there's some suggestions in the slides. You can have a look online. Um, I've skipped, uh, skipped over a few, but I want to focus on one thing, which, is, which seems to be a useful place to start. And that's uh, something that we call thinnest viable platform. A platform could be a single wiki page telling you how to use AWS or Azure or some IoT platform, some, some IoT solution. It might just be literally a list of install this, then run this script, install this certificate, and then you're off. That might be your platform, a wiki page. So that's the thinnest viable platform. If that's all you need to get that platform in place to enable development teams to go more quickly, don't build anything more. Just keep it there because you don't want to be building a great big monstrous platform thing. It needs to be as thin as possible to enable the teams to go as quickly as possible, quickly and safely. So ask yourselves in your organization, what is the thinnest platform that could possibly work? And, don't, and build that, but no more. And obviously over time, as you scale out, like, like Skybit have done, that platform will grow but we have to make sure it doesn't get any thicker than necessary. Think about the experience for people using that platform. Invest in uh, UX, so user experience capabilities within the groups that are building the platform. Typically, the platform, in some organizations, the platform is, is built by kind of infrastructure ops people. We need to have user experience people. We need to have what's called developer experience. Effectively, it's user experience for developers. The thing about DevEx in the context of the platform, how friendly is it to use that platform? How easy it is for, for teams to actually consume it and to work with it? And that's a great place to start because lots of organizations have already got aspects of this in place, but actually they haven't really thought, well, is it as thin as possible? What are the capabilities that we're actually providing? Is it easy to use? Uh, So these, these are the things that we also need to address. Although the Spotify model is great, we've looked at these things, cognitive load, Conway's law, um, these three different team interaction modes, and then using those to help evolve the organization. Um, so that's basically it. If you're, if you're interested in more um, details, uh, head to teamtopologies.com and sign up. And we'll be doing uh, Q&As, interviews. Um, I, for example, are going to ask Andy at the end of this session whether I can do a Q&A with him. And we'll post that on the website as a, as a blog post. Um, and if you're even more interested, then uh, buy the book on the 6th of September. That comes out. Thank you very much. Thank you.